Hey guys, this is EC Service Tech, and today what we're looking at is heat exchanger failure. All right, we're going to just talk about a few items here. Uh, this is an older, early 90s, um, early 1990s, 90% 90 efficient furnace heat exchanger. Okay, uh, these are the early heat exchangers that were used, and because of the way that the secondary heat exchanger was built, which would be this one right here. Uh, they tend to fail, okay? Um, this is the primary heat exchanger and this is where the combustion gas mixed with the uh, uh, with the air, all right, and ignition source and you'd have your flame and exhaust come right over to here and you're gonna get your exhaust being sucked through this heat exchanger. And then it comes to the back, right back here, and then it comes over and meets the secondary heat exchanger. Over in here is where you're basically absorbing your heat from water that is created during the flame process. So water is created during the flame process. It is one of the byproducts. It's a chemical byproduct of the um, flame process. So anyway, um, water vapor is being carried in the exhaust and then you're cooling uh, the, the exhaust and the water down so much that you, you end up condensating the water in here and then it and then it's basically trickling and trickling out of the system. So this side looks pretty good, right? Um, this is where the inducer motor connects to and you have some gasketing material and everything and, and that all looks pretty good. This area is pretty good. There's no cracks in the heat exchanger over here in the primary heat exchanger. All right, but let me show you what happened here. This The problem with these heat exchangers was um, you, you, the pressure switch would still close, okay? The, the pressure switch is supposed to prove that the inducer motor is running, all right? And that the condensate lines are, are not clogged, all right? So this right here is supposed to be uh, protecting the furnace um, to know, like say, if there's a clogged heat exchanger. The problem with it is, in a horizontal state, you might have two, okay, that are working right, and, and the one could be clogged, and that is what's gonna create a fire. All right, so here is the combustion chamber right here. So here's the combustion chamber, and it connects right here, right onto here, okay? You have your one, two, three uh, burner assemblies right there, and you have on this side your flame rollout switch, okay? This is your flame rollout switch, on this one, you can see that the problem occurred over on this side, all right? So there was no flame rollout switch over here, and now that's why you see a lot of uh, combustion areas have two, sometimes even three, uh, flame rollout sensors that, that do not automatically reset. They have to be manually reset because if they do ever trip, that means that there's a fire in here and, and there's more a bigger problem at hand, okay? They do not automatically reset. So, um, there was a problem here, and you see that this PVC pipe actually started burning. This right here, plastic assembly started melting. It started melting its way off of here, and the fire started coming up towards the top. All right, you can see this. All right, this assembly started getting very, very hot. All right, and uh, the homeowner, luckily, smelling some weird some weird smells in the house all right I believe this was right above his living area uh, his living room okay um, so so anyway once again that you could have two of these working fine say say you know it's going through all the way over to here and it's finding finding its way back to here so so this pressure switch is finding negative pressure enough to close because there's a, a tube connected from here onto the inducer motor assembly, all right? Um, but if one, say say one path is clogged, you, you could then have a problem, all right? Meaning that if one path is clogged, then, then basically the, the flame is not getting sucked in here and the exhaust is not getting sucked in here. If it's not getting sucked in here, it's just, you know, rising, heat rises, and it's just gonna come right here and it's gonna melt and burn everything, all right? So it's not good. All right, so now let's go ahead and take a look at the other side. So here, really, over on this side is where the problem side is. So I'm gonna shift this around so that you can see uh, what it looks like. 
I'll also give you a quick shot from, from top so that you can see what this looks like from overhead. So let's do that first. Let me give you a quick shot of what this looks like and then we'll go ahead to the back. All right, so this is where the flame originates right here. And then you have the exhaust being pulled through this way. All right, then you have a little rib heat exchanger part of the primary right here comes to the back and then joins to the secondary. And then it, it comes right through here and any water condensates and comes down towards the bottom and trickles out. Now here's, here's an issue, right? Okay. So the normal heat exchangers, right? Made out of steel and galvanized tin. Look here, you have water condensating here. All right. And it's the same material. All right. It's, it's, it's not exactly the same material as this, but it's still a material that a metal that's going to go ahead and, and rust regardless of what surface protection, you know, was put on it. Okay. So that's a problem. This is along the back side right here. That was pulled off. That plate was pulled off. As well, here is the other plate, all right, that holds all of the exhaust, you know, to, to connect the primary to the secondary. Now I'm gonna go ahead and switch this around so you can see what the back looks like. So you have your plate right here on the inside and under this plate, okay, that holds all of the exhaust gas is in, all right, with a, with a gasket that runs around the perimeter. Now this is pretty pretty rusted, but it's still, you know, in in good enough shape, all right, to to hold all the exhaust gases. This over here is your problem area. So if you look at this side right here, you can see that this is still open enough to have the pressure switch read a negative vacuum when the inducer motor is pulling. All right, but you look over here and this is actually clogged solid. Let me get you a close up shot of this. Okay, here's a close up shot of where the, the one burner tube shoots into the primary heat exchanger and then into the secondary heat exchanger. So this spot right here, okay, is where it was clogging to the point where uh, the inducer motor was no longer able to suck uh, the exhaust gas through which meant that the flame just started burning upright, all right, and then started uh, burning part of the furnace and, and getting very, very hot, um, and the exhaust gases were not getting out of the house. So, so right here, this is completely clogged solid. You can see all the flakes and stuff like that. Right here, this is a sandwich bag, all right, full of rust that just fell right out of this as soon as this was opened, all right, no good. All right, some of the things that you want to look out for when doing preventative maintenance for uh, gas furnaces, especially these older um, early 90s furnaces, um, you want to look right in this area right here, you know, anywhere around in here for any excess soot that build up, okay? Um, you want to make sure that you see a flame from this side. You want to see that the flame on each of these three are all getting pulled, up, pulled in uh, basically in the same manner okay so you, you don't see like one here one here getting pulled in real nice and straight and then this one is off a little bit okay so if uh, you could have a cracked heat exchanger say a crack you know over in here somewhere and what that would do is is everything would look fine in the burner box right here everything would look fine as far as the flames go nice blue flame and then when the blower motor turns on the blower motor pushes air across this coil, like say across it, but while it does that, it uh, it goes in through the crack and and it blows back out this way, and and that would make this flame rollout switch pop because you'd have a flame like popping a little bit like this, you know, it it would actually pop out. Um, but in the case of a clogged heat exchanger, you want to make sure that you have a good path that the flame is going. Um, going in, okay, like the same amount on all three or all four or all five, okay, you know, all two. Um, as well, you can check your uh, combustion analysis. You know, these furnaces basically um, are, are basically preset. The only thing that you can adjust on these uh, furnaces is the actual amount of gas um, getting coming into these uh, orifices right here. All right, so you could adjust them with a combustion analysis uh, reader 
Um, and also in this case, you could check that again, once again, just doing your preventative maintenance and making sure things are, are still you know, within their acceptable levels. Now you could disconnect the tube off of your pressure switch and connect that to your digital manometer in order to get a uh, water column reading off of your inducer motor, basically uh, verifying how much you're able to, to suck through. Okay? The problem with that is a lot of times manufacturers data doesn't have what it should be. Otherwise, this would be a great uh, way to uh, test to see if your heat exchanger is clogging over time. Now, if you're on a preventative maintenance schedule, you could uh, catalog, you know, you could write down the reading that you're getting with your digital manometer. And if you see it decreasing over time, uh, that w could be an indication that this is clogging up. All right, so just keep that in mind as you're doing your preventative maintenance. Uh, and you can always go back on your, uh, your, your service invoices that you, you're filling out during the preventative maintenance. Um, you can always use them. Those are a great tool, you know, just to, to test for, to show degradation in a furnace. All right, so on some of these early 90s heat exchangers, the typical warranties were running right around 20 year uh, warranty on the heat exchanger. And in it tends to take quite a while to replace a heat exchanger. It could take, say, three, four hours. Basically, you have to take all of the items out that are in front of the heat exchanger in order to get to it and then reinstall it and gasket it all up properly. Um, so a lot of customers tend to uh, end up upgrading to a, a higher efficiency furnace if you have a clog or a crack in the heat exchanger. Uh, but in some cases, labor is included uh, from the manufacturer, especially if there was some type of a suit that was won against the manufacturer of the equipment due to uh, a failure, um, a recognized failure, you know, within the time period of that 20 years uh, lifespan. Uh, but uh, you would have to take the model number of your furnace and then also find the installation date of the furnace. And if you don't have, say, an initial proposal uh, bill from the installation, uh, then you're going to have to go by the serial number of the furnace in order to determine what the age is, uh, but uh, you know, in order to find out if you would fit within that time period. But anyway, I just wanted to give you a quick rundown of that in reference to the primary and secondary heat exchanger, just so you are aware of that. And I uh, hope you enjoyed yourself. We'll see you next time at AC Service Tech Channel.